You turn in your King James Bible to the book of Romans, chapter 15. I'm going to be talking today about the sins of Abraham. Uh, a lot of people would say, well, don't point out other people's sins and don't judge other people and whatever else. But yet there's a reason that the King James Bible would list the sins that Abraham committed. Uh, and it wasn't just one. It was multiple sins. Three in particular that we will be going over today. We're going to be going over a lot of scriptures. It's going to be a good Bible study. And I'm going to show you why the Bible lists these sins. But we'll start out here in the book of Romans chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. And here's the key, <clears throat> verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. The things that are written aforetime are written for our learning. Back here in the Old Testament. What good is the Old Testament if we're, all, if in, if we're in the New Testament right now? Why do we have to go back to the Old Testament? Because the things that are written aforetime are written for our learning. That we through patience uh, and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. You see, this book will judge you. It will judge the men's sins in here. And it will judge your sins today. And my sins as well. And you say, well, that's just terrible. No, because there's a solution to sin. And you can actually be comforted by the scriptures. Yes, you will be judged. Yes, this book says some rather bad things about you and I as sinners. But the reality of it is there's also comfort there. And that's the point of today's study. Um, you say, you're just trying to tear down Abraham. You're not as good a man as Abraham. Well, probably not. The book of James, chapter 2. There's some things that... Uh, Abraham did that I wouldn't do if my life depended on it. Um, I think he was quite uh, wrong in some of the things that he did. But I want to read a verse here. It's very important. Um, James chapter 2, verse 23. It says here, And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God kind of an interesting thing here. It's a title. The friend of God. Who is that? Abraham. All right. Now we're going to get into these sins. Go back to the book of Genesis where we read about Abraham. People have these kooky notions that, you know, you shouldn't bring up people's sins and you shouldn't judge sin and you should, you know, it's lordship salvation if you talk about sin and whatever else and tell people that they need to turn from sin and all these other things. Uh, no, actually, it's not. Um, if you have to turn from sin to be saved, and okay, then that's a problem. And nobody can really define what Lordship Salvation is because there's nothing in here saying, beware of Lordship Salvation because it is defined thus. No, and the Lordship Salvation thing is, it's you know, like a rubber ruler. I mean, you can make it into anything you want. You know, and I've seen that thing so many times over the years. I've been accused of teaching Lordship Salvation because I say a man's life will change once he gets genuinely born again. That's not Lord, Lordship Salvation. Um, what I define Lordship Salvation as is when the Calvinists come out and they say, uh, Christ has to be Lord of your life before the Holy Spirit is given to you, before you get saved. All right. Um, if he's not Lord of all, then he's not Lord at all. That's another way that they'll say it. He has to, you have to have this cleaned up life completely, you know, basically they'll say, well, you, yes, you're still a sinner, but you know, there's a, some real big changes that happen. And then the Holy Spirit comes and grants you repentance and then you get saved. Total satanic heresy. But the other opposite end of that spectrum, you have that side is bad. But then the other side is that you just pray a prayer, you make a, a profession of belief and there doesn't have to be any changes um, and you get these totally, completely wicked people, and they'll say, oh, I think that he's saved. I think he's saved because he says he's saved. Uh, that's the other end that's wrong. Both sides are wrong. All right? The biblical salvation is you come to the Lord in a repentant, broken, contrite state, understanding that you're a sinner, understanding that you cannot save yourself. There's no self-righteousness. Uh, you have to turn from that, definitely. You have to turn from your own self-righteousness, because if you don't, then you think that you're a good person. 
and it's just, you know, Jesus is just kind of, oh, yeah, you know, well, I'll take him too. Or No, I have nothing good within me to save myself, right? I come to the Lord and I get saved. I ask him to save me. Salvation is his, not mine to do, all right? You come, you say, God, would you please save me? I believe what your word says. Do you have, you know, could you please, you know, the grace that you've promised to me based on my faith, please save me. God saves you. But now his Holy Spirit comes in when, when you truly get born again. There's a new birth there. You become a new creature in Christ Jesus. You will still sin. You will still struggle with sin. You don't, I don't ever teach sinless perfection. Again, it's another lie about this ministry. People have said, I teach sinless perfection. I have sermons against sinless perfection. But people are too lazy to actually do the, the work. They just like to falsely accuse me. Um, you don't become sin, sinlessly perfect. All right? But there's some major changes that start to happen in your life. And there's doctrinal things, very important doctrines in the King James Bible that you will understand if the Holy Spirit's there. But when you get people that say, I'm a Christian, and they hate those doctrines, and they hate the King James Bible itself, uh, no, it didn't take. All right? Uh, you're not truly born again. So just to clarify my stand. But let's look here. Genesis chapter 12, we'll begin in verse 10 and go down through verse 20. We're going to see the first of his sins here. And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. Now, we'll just stop for a minute. Early on, he's called Abram, and then she's called Sarai, and then later it's Abraham and Sarah. All right? So, <clears throat> just to get that out of the way. Verse 11, And it came to pass, when he was come near to enter into Egypt, that he said unto Sarai his wife, Behold thou, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass, when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. Huh? Uh, what's his first sin? He's a coward. I'm not the world's bravest man. Um, I admit I have my faults and my fears and things. I'm not real great at starting conversations with people. Once they're started, I'm fine. I can talk and whatever, but I'm not a salesman kind of a real outgoing. I've never been real outgoing. Um, <clears throat> but uh, when it comes to my wife, people messing with my wife, um, I get real radical really quickly. Okay, um, I'm a jealous husband, so to speak. Uh, she can talk to anybody that she wants to, uh, whatever. That's not that I, you know, keep her locked in a room or something. I mean, she goes places without me. It's fine. But what I'm saying is if I'm out someplace and I see some guy and he's looking at her or whatever else, I'll glare at the guy. And if it has to go further than that, it'll go further than that. Um, but you don't mess with my wife. Okay. And if there's a bunch of strong guys coming down through the town, Honey, go on inside here. I'll take care of this. I'm not going to say, tell them that you're my sister because then my life will be saved because of you. <sighs> what a coward. Um, <clears throat> verse 14. And it came to pass that when Abram was come into Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. The princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commanded her before Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. I mean, wouldn't that be enough to, if you're a real man, to say, oh, hold on a second, that's my wife there. Don't you touch her. Get your hands off of her. Abraham was a coward. We'll get back to it here in a minute. Don't get all excited. Oh, you're saying that. Just let me prove my point with the study. Verse 16, And he entreated Abram well for her sake, and he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why saidst thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her uh, to me to wife. Now therefore behold thy wife, take her and go thy way. Do you think Pharaoh respected Abraham? No, he didn't. See, that's another thing. If you're a man, you have to act like a man to get the respect of other men. Uh, hey, just say, I'm her, you know, you're my sister and whatever. And then he stands there and they're giving him all these gifts and things. And he sees Sarah being taken into Pharaoh's house to be his wife. And he's 
I'll just be quiet. Uh, it was bad all around. It was a terrible thing to do. And he didn't get the respect of Pharaoh. Uh, Genesis chapter 20. You want to have respect as a man, then you better act like a man. And the quickest way to prove that you're a man is if you're married, stand up for your wife. Don't let another man mess with her. And don't pretend that she's your sister. Genesis chapter 20, verse 1 through 18. Here we have it happen again. And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur and sojourn in Gerar. And Abram said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. See, now you have Abraham and Sarah. Now the names have changed. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. And Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? <laughs> Lost man. Isn't it interesting? Said he not, uh, unto me she is my sister and she even she herself said he is my brother and the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this and God said unto him in a dream yea I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart for I also withheld thee from sinning against me therefore suffered I thee not to touch her now therefore restore the man his wife for he is a prophet and he shall pray for thee and thou shalt live and if thou restore her not Know that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Let me stop there for a minute. Now, here's the interesting thing. You get people that, are, that say, well, I'm lost, or there's what about people in other countries that, you know, I'm lost and I don't know the Bible, I don't know whatever God, you know, I don't know that God exists and things. And you get other countries, they don't even have the Bible there and they've never heard the gospel, and what about that? Well, here you have a man, Abimelech, that... God is coming to him and saying, hey, you've messed with another man's wife. And Abimelech doesn't say, well, I didn't know that. I didn't know, you know, uh, as far as what's wrong with that. I'll say it that way. Um, in other words, the Ten Commandments there, thou shalt not commit adultery, that was in Abimelech's heart. He knew the Ten Commandments without seeing the Ten Commandments. And you get, get a lot of these people in other foreign countries, unless they've completely seared their conscience and they're just pagan heathen, they understand Thou shalt not commit adultery. Don't take another man's wife. Um, there's a book that I have in my collection here, uh, Eternity in Their Hearts, and it talks about how that some of these heathen tribes, like in Papua New Guinea, they, when they went in in the 1960s and 70s, um, they were talking to the people, and the people were saying, they said, what are your morals and your rules and things? Well, you shouldn't take another man's wife. You shouldn't steal. And they basically were listing the Ten Commandments. Uh, very fascinating. God writes his laws on every man's heart. And they have to have some way of reprogramming that in order to disobey it. So you get through college indoctrination. Uh, there is no God. There is no Bible. Do what you want. You know, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. <laughs> Aleister Crowley taught in schools. That's kind of the motto of uh, secular universities and a lot of the Christian ones as well. Uh, just do whatever you want to do. There is no God, really, and so, you know, there's no perfect Bible. You get no God in the secular university, and you get no Bible in the Christian colleges. And so what do you have? Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. You know, the heart of Satanism. You can be as gods, knowing good and evil. Do whatever you want to do. See? But you had to get through that conscience first. That had to be there, and you had to get rid of that. But here you have Abimelech, and he's obeying the Ten Commandments in terms of thou shalt not commit adultery. But here's the really interesting thing. Are you aware that uh, here in Genesis chapter 20, the Ten Commandments weren't even revealed yet? Hmm. This is before Moses is even born. Isn't that something? A very interesting point against people that say, oh, what about those that have never heard? They have the law of God written in their hearts. Here you have a, a pagan man back before the Ten Commandments are even given, and he knows it's wrong to commit adultery. Very interesting. Um, <clears throat> verse 8. Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told all these things in their ears, and the men were sore afraid. Why? Because they had the law of God written in their hearts too. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, What hast thou done unto us? And what have I offended thee, and that thou hast brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? 
He knows he's a, he knows he's a sinner. Amazing. That thou hast, or thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. You know, see what a coward does? Let me just pause here for a minute. What a coward does when you sin against the Lord and you don't stand up as a Christian man or a Christian lady if there's an opportunity for you to stand up. You know what happens? If the righteous man or woman that you're dealing with has more guts than you do and has better righteous standards than you do, and then they find out that you're saved, that you're a Christian. They'll look and they'll say, you're supposed to be a Christian? Why would you do this? You've done a great evil here. And it's pretty bad because I'm having to point it out to you. Cowardice as a Christian um, shouldn't be an option. But there's times we do it, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. I'd be lying to you if I said, well, I've never been a coward in any area at all. Well, yes, I have. There have been times I should have spoken up and I kept my mouth shut and whatever else. You don't win any respect for that. Something to remember. Uh, verse 10, And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? And Abraham said, Because I thought, Surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. And yet indeed she is my sister, she is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. And it came to pass when God calls me to wander from my father's house, that I said unto her, This is thy kindness, which thou shalt show unto me. At every place uh, whither we shall come, say of me, He is my brother. And Abimelech took sheep and oxen and man servants, men servants and women servants, and gave them unto Abraham, and restored him Sarah his wife. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before thee, dwell where it pleaseth thee. And unto Sarah he said, Behold, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. Um, behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes unto all that are with thee, and with all other. Thus she was reproved. Isn't it interesting that God had to use a lost man to reprove a saved woman? So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech, and his wife, and his maidservants, and they bare children. For the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Um, I'll just give you a little interesting thing here, brethren. I firmly believe in the fact that you and I control how much evil goes on out there in terms of, uh, let me say it this way. If we take strong stands, the righteous standards that God helps us to do will actually help the lost world to have something to look to. Ye are the light of the world, a light that shines in a dark place. If we don't shine, if we shut our light off, there's nothing out there to convict the lost people. But if we come out into the lost world and we're going like this, shining our light like that, the lost people start to say, oh, I'm sorry, please excuse my language. And, and oh, I, let me get the door for you, ma'am. And, you know, if you're actually dressed like a lady and, and they start to do things. But it's a pretty bad thing when a Christian gets to messing around in sin and they keep their mouth shut and they're a coward. And the lost person has to come along and say, uh, here, let me show you a little bit of righteousness there, uh, Christian. You're a coward. That's sin number one, cowardice. Go to Genesis chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13. <clears throat> okay, we'll begin here in verse one. And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. Um, you have to be careful with the thing of riches. You get a lot of physical wealth that can start to mess you up, which we'll see here. And he went on his journey, on his journeys from the south even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hai, unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great. 
so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled in the, then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou wilt depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes, and behold, all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Interesting because the number 13 in the Bible is a number of sort of a cursed thing. So what do we have here? We have Genesis chapter 13, verse 13, talking about the men of Sodom were wicked uh, and sinners exceedingly, or before the Lord exceedingly. Hmm. But uh, you say, what's the sin there? I don't understand what was Abraham's or Abram's sin in that context there. Uh, worldliness. Who do you think he was selling the cattle to? Save people? No. And um, their operation's getting bigger and bigger. Hey, Lot, where do you want to go? I mean, don't tell me that there was no business dealings between Abram, Lot, and the men of Sodom. Going in there with all the, how many herd of cattle and whatever else, Abram and Lot, the cowboys that they were, you know, riding on their horses. Don't think they had six guns or anything, but uh, the whole point is they're herdmen, they're cowboys. Hmm, it's roundup time. Let's head into the lights of town where all the money's at and all the people in there that are going to pay us a good uh, wage for this and get wealthy. You say, well, that doesn't really prove that he's worldly. and think, Oh, we'll see about that. A man starts to get some good money like that. He starts to worry about his business connections. Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day, and he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts. After that ye shall pass on, for therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, So do as thou hast said. And Abraham hastened, hastened, hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. And Abraham ran unto the herd and fetched a calf tender and good and gave it unto a young man, and he hasted to dress it. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall, shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laughed not, <laughs> lying to the Lord, um, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. Uh, don't lie to the Lord like that. Uh, but people lie because they're afraid. Uh, good point on that. And the men rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, 
and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. Um, stop there right there for a minute. I'm going to just say this real quickly. Don't be fooled by Trinitarians. One of the little arguments that some come up with, there's others that actually a little bit are a little bit smarter on this and they won't bring this out because it's easily refuted from Scripture. And they'll try to say that this is the Trinity that showed up there. It's the Lord and it's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. <laughs> no, it's not. There's no God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There's God the Father in the Bible, King James Bible, but the other two titles don't exist. Okay, There aren't three gods and then they all pretend to be one God. That's not true. There's only one God. Okay, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father and the Holy Spirit being part of the Godhead that Jesus Christ is part of. Body, soul, spirit. Three parts to one body. Very simple. So don't fall for that. Okay, if you study the context, it's the Lord and two angels. Because it goes on that the, uh, verse nine, chapter 19, verse 1, and there came two angels to Sodom and even. The Lord sends them down there to go down and check it out for him. So it's the Lord and two angels. That's the three that shows up there in uh, Genesis chapter 18. Let me just get that out there. Verse 20, back here to Genesis chapter 18, verse 20. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? <clears throat> you mean your money, Abraham? He said, no, he's just concerned about Lot. Abraham was a rich man. He was thinking about his business connections down there. Verse 24, Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city, Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? Come on, Abraham. You think he didn't know? You think he was going down there? He didn't know anything about Sodom and Gomorrah and whatever? He knew. He knew. Even if he avoided the city, he still talked to Lot and everything. There's communication there. It wasn't just about Lot. It was about business connections down there. You know? It's kind of like you and me. We're out and, and whatever. You get around people and you think, I don't know if that guy's saved for sure. I'm not really sure, you know. And the Lord would say, hey, I'm going to destroy this whole city. Uh, well, what if there's 50 righteous people down there? Lord, uh, could you spare the city for that? I, I'm not really sure. There's a few people I'm kind of leaning one way or the other. And then you start to think, actually, no. I remember that one time he yeah, was using some pretty foul language and, and uh, yeah, he was using God's name in vain. And, yeah, okay, no, that guy, scratch him out. Oh, that one other guy found out that he's, you know, Freemason. And, yeah, scratch him out. No, that other guy, yeah, actually saw him walking out of that, you know, bar the one time and he was with a guy. Or Okay, yeah, no. That's what Abraham's doing. But he's concerned about his business connections. Guarantee it. Uh, verse 25. That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. And Abraham answered and said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, where, which am but dust and ashes. Peradventure there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. Wilt thou destroy all the city for lack of five? And he said, If I find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. And he spake, you know, you can tell Abraham's counting up in his mind. <laughs> He's coming back with new calculations here. Um, and he spake unto him, him yet again and said, Peradventure there shall be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. And he said unto him, O let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak, Peradventure there shall be there, there shall thirty be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Peradventure there shall be twenty found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. And he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry. And I, and I will speak yet but this once. Peradventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham. And Abraham returned unto his place probably wringing his hands, thinking about the money that he was going to lose. He's, oh, come on, Brian. There's just no way. You're being really nasty here. It wasn't about business connections. 
I guarantee you it was about business connections. Why would there be a reason that a righteous man would say, spare a city that's known for sodomy, that's known for perversion? Lord, please, please don't spare them. And why was Lot in there? And you study the story, you go into the next chapter, Lot, the sodomites come to try to rape the angels that came. That's a real good thing. You know, really dumb thing to do. They're down there trying to check and see if the city's evil enough that they need to destroy it. Hey, yeah, let's so the men of the city go out and try to, you know, sodomize them. But Lot, what does he do? I have two young daughters that have not known men. Here, I'm going to send them out. You can do whatever you want. It messed Lot up. It messed him up very badly. Not to mention the fact that he's going down in there to Sodom and Gomorrah. He's went in as a single guy and now he's married and he has children. Uh, he got married to a city woman in there. Destroyed his morals. Destroyed his character. Lot was a saved man. The Bible says so later on in the New Testament. But uh, it really messed him up. And he goes out of the city after the whole thing is destroyed. And he goes out into a cave in the mountains and his two daughters get him drunk and they have children to their own father. Real good moral convictions, real, real good thing there, living in Sodom. Why would Abraham want to, to preserve it? You know why? For the same reason some of you out there are trying to say, God bless America. That's why. Because you stand to lose a lot of money if God punishes this wicked nation. Oh God, please, please save our country. I want to make America great again. Really? Um... Worldliness there, the sin of worldliness that Abraham was involved in, you're involved in it too. I have to wonder if the, a lot, the judgment that should be happening to America, I have to wonder if it's because some Christians are praying for the exact opposite of what they should be doing. And God's saying, you know, uh, I guess I'll spare America because there's still 50 righteous down there. There's still 40, 30, or 45, and then 30, uh, 20, and 10. There's still some down there. So I guess I'll just spare America. Shouldn't we say, hey, whatever happens, I would go to be with the Lord. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Lord, stop this nation. Stop America from producing more pornography, from going and these, making these ridiculous wars that they kill their own soldiers along with the enemy and things. You know, you can't win these wars. They're just wars to, to solidify drugs or oil or other types of things like that while saying we're bringing freedom. You know, all the stuff, the, the wickedness, the Hollywood filth, the music that America's put out. God, please stop it. But you got a bunch of little worldly Christians going around. Oh, God bless America. Oh, I want my children to grow up in the America that I grew up in. And Oh, it's such a wonderful thing. Oh, I'd like to see America come back again. You're worldly. You're wicked and you're worldly. Oh, but brother... <laughs> If God would judge this nation, I could lose my business and I could lose my home and I wouldn't be able to pay my mortgage and, and things like that. Oh, I might die. Oh, yeah, you'd go to heaven. What are you worried about? Why not pray, God, please destroy this wicked nation. Judge America. If you see it fit to, to spare my life, okay, I'll do whatever I can, when the, whatever the new country is. But this nation has to come to an end. We are the biggest exporter of filth and sin and wickedness. Don't be like Abraham. Don't get into the sin of worldliness. And get to the point where you just love this world so much that you don't want to see it judged. Let's go on to the third sin. Genesis chapter 16. Genesis chapter 16. We'll begin in verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children, and she had an handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai, and Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid the Egyptian, mingled seed, in other words, is what just happened here, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife. And he, he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived, and when she saw that she 
had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarai said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between me and thee. She knew she sinned. Abram, be a man. Say, no, I'm not doing that. She's an Egyptian. She's a bondservant. I'm not going to mingle my seed with her. No way. I refuse to do it. But what did he do? Hearken unto the voice of his wife. Is he a little bit henpecked there or something, perhaps? You know? I mean, first of all, he says to her, you know, pretend that you're my sister. I don't want to die. You can save my life, please. He's a coward. Then he's worldly. Oh, God, please spare Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't want anything bad to happen to them. He's worldly. And now he's in disobedience. Hey, I'm going to give you a son with your wife, Sarah, or Sarai there, you know. Lord, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. And Sarah Iger says, well, pfft, it won't work through me. So, um, hey, Abram, take this Egyptian and go have children. And then when the Lord comes in there in Genesis chapter 18, and he says, I'm going to give you a son through your wife. She's in there. <laughs> the Lord says, what are you laughing at? You laughed. Oh, I didn't laugh. Nay, but thou, did, thou, thou didst laugh or whatever. You did laugh. She lied. She laughed at God. I mean, you know, you're talking about a physical manifestation of God. Theophany, that the, you know, they want to say. God manifests in the flesh. He's right there. You're watching him. A pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. Right there. And he says, this is what's going to happen. And she goes, yeah, right. And then when he confronts her, she says, I didn't do that. <laughs> and Sarah's a, a great woman, by the way. But she was a sinner. Genesis chapter 21. It's the thing I love about this King James Bible. It doesn't pull any punches when it comes to talking about you and I. This book condemns sinners. It's not, oh, holy, floating above the ground like the Muslim stuff up here, the, you know, noble Quran and everything, the most noble Quran. No, it's a book that says Holy Bible, Holy Scriptures, and guess what? It talks about sinners. And all the characters in here just list their sins one after another. Makes a fool out of them. That's why I believe this King James Bible is God's book. And junk like that and the Catholic catechisms, old saint so-and-so, the incorruptible saint, you know, they see these corpses, you know, in these Catholic cathedrals and they're laying there, you know, this dead corpse like this and they say it's an incorruptible saint <laughs> looks pretty corruptible to me rotted uh, carcass there Genesis chapter 21 verse 1 and the Lord visited Sarah as he had said and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken for Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him God told him when he was going to do it and Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was an hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh, so that all that hear will laugh with me. A laughter of joy. No more God, in, you know, laughing and mocking God. No, her laughter now came uh, in joy. She had the right spirit, in other words, after she really messed up bad. Uh, she had a broken, contrite spirit after that. And God um, did a great thing for her, and then she laughed in joy. Verse 7, And she said, Who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah should have given him, or given children suck? For I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had borne unto Abraham, mocking. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And the thing, which, the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad, and because of thy bondwoman, in all that Sarah had, hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. 
for in Isaac shall thy seed be called, and also of the, and also of the son of the bondwoman will I make a great nation, or will I make a nation, because he is thy seed. Um, did God make a big nation, a great nation, out of uh, Ishmael? Yes, he did. And you know the funny thing? They've been fighting against the seed of Isaac ever since. And it all came from disobedience on both their part. It wasn't just Sarah. It was Abraham hearkening unto the voice of his wife when he shouldn't, when he shouldn't have. Here he did because God told him to um, cast her out. And he doesn't say, you know, Hagar, you know, let's all, let's just not be racist here or whatever else, you know, that she's Hagar. She's your other wife. She's a bondwoman. She's an Egyptian bondwoman. Cast her out, kick her out. Don't try to make the Bible conform to your modern politically correct speech. Okay? Uh, go to John chapter 15. We'll end it here. What did the Bible say in James chapter 2, verse 23? It's called uh, Abraham, God's friend, the friend of God. Well, I have a question for you. Go to John chapter 15, beginning in verse 13. My question for you as you're turning your Bible, have you struggled with cowardice or worldliness or disobedience? Yes. There have been times I've been cowardly. There have been times I've been worldly. And there's times I have outright disobeyed the Lord. Well, if Abraham could do all of those things and still be called the friend of God, do you think that there might be some hope for you and me? What a friend we have in Jesus. John chapter 15, verse 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that ye should bring, go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that ye love one another. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. You want to be a friend of the Lord? Then um, be willing to bear his reproach. That's one of the quickest ways to tell true friendship. If somebody's out there and they say, um, people are making fun of me and whatever else, and old Denlinger's a nut and everything else, and, you, and you know, oh yeah, you know, he's, I, I watched some of his videos, but he's, he's a little crazy, and, and you just let me get ripped to pieces and things, you're not much of a friend. But if you say, well, you know, Brian's not right 100% of the time, but I've been blessed by some of what he teaches. Oh, you don't believe that Godhead doctrine stuff, do you? Oh, uh, well, that's what the Bible teaches. That's what the King James Bible says. You know, oh, that's Denlinger. He came up with it. No, actually, it isn't. There's been people that have been speaking about the Godhead doctrine before Brian was even born. Uh, no, that's what the Bible teaches. Oh, then you're one of those King James only people like Denlinger. You know, you're just in his cult. Well, I actually have good reasons for believing the King James Bible is God's word, and Denlinger doesn't have anything to do with that. Yeah, he's taught me about the issue, but I did my own research, and I don't need Denlinger to prove that the King James Bible is God's perfect word. Don't be afraid to defend me, you know, for the things I say right. If I say something stupid, well, then, yeah, don't defend me, whatever. Just say, yeah, I disagree with Brother Brian on that. But, you know, esteem me very highly in love for my work's sake. I try to put out good information. I'm putting my face out there. People know where my, this house is where I run the ministry. 
Uh, I'm willing to take on the Jesuits. I'm willing to take on the Papists and things like that. I, I'm fighting. You know, I tried my best to get stuff out there. Are you a friend of the ministry? Then, you know, stand up for me once in a while. I appreciate that. I don't run a cult here. I don't, I don't, you know, cults, they get the people in and you try to keep control the people, what they watch and whatever else. I don't care what you want to watch. I warn people. Don't, you know, you don't want to watch this guy or that guy. Yeah, I think he's lost. But you, if you want to watch them behind my back, do whatever you want. You don't want to take heed to my warnings. Well, okay, fine, whatever. But uh, I really appreciate it when I hear people saying, you know, um, brother, I, I put, uh, you know, look up Born Again Barbarian. Um, see if I can find this thing real quickly here. Um, I had a brother, and he just, he prints this up right here. Some scriptures that go over, and he puts down there. Look up, go on YouTube and look up Born Again Barbarian. Right there. King James Video Ministries. Another brother that has another ministry there, too. Just printed a little paper. Here you go. Here you go. Thank you, my friend. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. A lot of people go out there and they, they'll put things on their vehicles or whatever else. You're my friends. Thank you. I really do appreciate that. But even more than that, even more important than that, we need to be a friend of the Lord. Do the things that He commands us. Don't be ashamed of Him. Don't let people mock Him and tear Him down and whatever else. Um, we only have one life. And uh, we have to concentrate on defending the Word of God. I want to be a defender of God's book, the King James Bible. I'm not going to mess with the ones that come from the Vatican, which is proven. Again, it's not my conspiratorial weird thing. I think that there might be some proof. It comes from the Vatican. If you don't know this issue, if you're newly saved or you're trying to learn, right here we have the uh, Nestle's 27th edition, which the new versions, which, you know, are based on, the Nestle's text. And right here it says, the text shared by these two editions was adopted internationally by Bible societies and following an agreement between the Vatican and the United Bible Societies, it has served as the basis for new translations and for revisions made under their supervision. The Vatican supervision, in other words. I've showed this many times, but I'll show it one more time. Right there it is. Hopefully you can read that. Okay. So the new versions are from the Vatican. And you study them, you can see the NIV was partly translated at the University of Salamanca in Spain, a Catholic university. Um... All these new versions, they have, they have tie-ins to the Roman Catholic Church. And the Roman Catholic translations come from the same manuscripts as the new versions. I'm not going to support that stuff. Somebody uses a new version. I can't just say that everybody that uses a new version is automatically lost. I have to find out some information. Did you just get saved? Are you falling for this? Did you go to some place and say, I just got saved? Which Bible do you recommend to some Christian bookstore because they're ignorantly thinking that Christian bookstores are run by Christians. Most times they're not. Uh, they're run by uh, church building people and whatever else that are making merchandise of, of uh, anything that, you know, God type things and whatever else. I can't say the word of God because they don't make merchandise of the word of God. They make merchandise out of satanic counterfeits. But uh, they go in there and, and they, they're given a new version. And they don't know about the Bible version issue yet. Well, I'm going to take it easy on somebody like that. Um, but my standard is, if somebody is using a new version and they hate the King James Bible, they're not saved. Just as simple as that. You cannot go to the enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Roman Catholic Church, and get one of their new versions and be using it and hating the King James Bible, which God's blessing is upon for the English-speaking world. You can't do that and tell me you're saved and the Holy Spirit's leading you. Sorry, uh, I don't believe that. So, be brave, brethren. Um, but understand the comfort. The things that are written aforetime are written for our learning. Okay? You're supposed to be comforted in that. And I find it a great comfort to point out Abraham's sins. People say, oh, Brian thinks he's you know, without sin. Oh, no, no. I'm perfectly well, well aware of my sins. I have a lot of sins that I have to deal with. Um, but I like to see other sinners out there, like Abraham. 
and he can mess up so horribly. Mess up. What a coward. She's my sister. <laughs> you know, she's my sister. Go ahead. Oh, Pharaoh's taking her into her house. Oh, boy, I hope he doesn't fornicate with my wife. <sighs> Stinking coward. Oh, God. Please, God, don't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, can it, if you find ten righteous men, can you not do... Worldly. Um, I'm going to give you a son through your wife. Wife comes along. It's not happening yet, so uh, go on into my handmaid there. And he goes in. Has a bears a child that ends up fighting his actual seed, the seed of the promise. There, they fight for thousands of years. Why? Because he disobeyed. Cowardly, worldly disobedience, and yet still the friend of God. Show me that in any other religion out there. Can't beat it. There's nothing better than than Bible believing Christianity. Nothing at all. That's going to be it for this study. And uh, have another one to do yet today. Another good study coming up um, about do you love the resurrection? Had a request. Uh, could you please do a study on the rapture? Well, the rapture more properly is called the resurrection. So I'm going to be doing that next. Uh, so that is going to be it for this study. As always, thank you for watching. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you to those out there that support King James Video Ministries. I'll fight. I will fight. All right, don't ever forget that. Uh, your money is not going to some kind of a ministry that I'm going to waste it paying off a mortgage to some building, some place that I call my church. Uh, I'm not going to waste the money on, name it. Uh, we live as simple and as cheaply as possible. And I can say this, uh, I have to speak foolishly for a minute. Please forgive me for having to do that, but I have to say some things about the ministry here. Uh, I don't know any other preacher that's going to take on the Vatican and all the other wickedness out there and things, the things that actually matter. Um, I don't know anybody else that takes on the stuff that I do. Um, no glory to me. The Lord puts it into my mind. I try to get it out there to people. Um, you put your uh, donation into this ministry, I take it seriously. Um, we don't go out to eat. We don't go on, we've been on vacation, I think, once in the last 10 years. All right, And it wasn't really a vacation. It was going out to my in-laws out in Iowa and getting some things that were my wife's and, you know, whatever we considered a vacation. Um, I'll fight hard. So more on that in an upcoming study, the whole thing of uh, what type of ministries you should give to and things and the importance of that. It is very important to give to ministries. You don't have to give to this ministry, whatever. I'm not trying to drum up some kind of thing. 10% of your income has to come here or else you're in sin. Or, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is I take my responsibilities very seriously. And love me or hate me, the one thing nobody can say about me is that I'm not a fighter. I will fight. Whether you disagree with me or not on some of my stands I take, I, I fight. And I get kicked around and there's whole websites dedicated to attacking me and tearing this ministry down and the lies and the slander that's been put out about me. And I'm still going to fight. And I go through spiritual attacks and things like that. There's times I don't even sleep at night. Um, I go through all kinds of stuff to bring out these sermons and to bring out this stuff and the fight. So we will see you in the next study. Uh, stick by your King James Bible brethren. And don't forget, no matter what you do, if you're born again, you're God's friend.